Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you a true story from the life of Nostradamus on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Here is our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Tonight, a true story from the life of Dr. Michel de Notre Dame, known to history as Nostradamus, the man who apparently could see through time prophet whose uncanny predictions have made him the center of three centuries of controversy and of wonder. And now here is Frank Goss. Every word you use paints a picture of you. The right words can add charm and brightness to that picture. That's why so many people choose Hallmark cards to express their personality in messages to friends. For Hallmark cards are carefully designed to carry the thoughts you want to send. To say, what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And the hallmark and crown on the back says, too, that you care enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, who celebrate their 30th anniversary at your favorite theater with their new color picture, Rose Marie, in Cinemascope, starring Anne Blythe, Howard Keel, and Fernando Lamas. And now Mr. Barrymore brings you our true story from the life of Nostradamus on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. The year is 1588. The city is Paris. The hour is midnight. The wet cobblestone streets are illuminated only by the dim green light of a twisted gibbous moon. The silence is broken only by the tramp of the town watch. Twelve o'clock and all's well within the walls of Paris. And by the clang of hoofs is a black coach bearing the escutcheon of Catherine de Medici, Queen of France, swings into the Rue Saint Antoine. Kindly night, my friend, even though the moon's bending toward Orion. In such a sky, the stars seem close, the fire's less cold. Ah, well, it will storm before morning. Is the secret of the weather, then, a part of your art, Major de Notre Dame? It requires but precious little science, Admiral, to know when the wind has changed from south to west. It will rain before sunup. I doubt it, monsieur. Oh? A gibbous moon means a fair morning. Any sailor knows that. Does he? It would seem, Admiral de Coligny, that you put but little stock in my prophecies, even the least of them. Not in prophecies, monsieur, nor in prophets. Ah, some charlatan trick, like the rest of them, sleight of hand. You overestimate me, monsieur. I cannot palm the thunder. Uh, bah. Perhaps, monsieur, you would care to test me further to know what I have seen in time that bears the future shape and face and form of the Grand Admiral of France. No, I would not. Why, I wonder. Is your mind already dark with the treason that will cause your blood to spurt and become the blood of France spilling in civil war? You dare to speak the truth? Yes, monsieur. That much I shall always dare. I, Saint-Denis, if you were of noble blood, Doctor, I'd have satisfaction from you before the night was done. But destiny prevents it, Monsieur the Admiral. My destiny and yours. You seem to take the thought of destiny very lightly, Doctor. Especially for a man who's being escorted to the gallows. Best 
steal three paces by three. A coffin for the living. And yet, I've known from that first beginning that this would be part of my future. It all started that day when the Count de Tende came into my study at Salon. Because of the Germans, they and their neighbors around them will be in wars for control of the clouds. The armies will fight in the sky for a long time. May I disturb your concentration, Michel? Oh, your excellency already has. <laughs> However, the future must always wait on the present. What brings you from Paris, Count? Another outbreak of the plague? No. The remedies of Dr. Michel de Notre Dame seem to have swept it out of Provence. In Paris, there is a new sort of plague. Ah, uh, a fever or no? Most definitely fever. A fever for the future, brought on by too much indulgence in the quatrains of Nostradamus. Oh, I am sure that illness will soon pass. Ah, uh, perhaps not. Even at the Louvre, they talk of nothing but your book, The Centuries, and its mysterious author. <laughs> The Queen herself has expressed the desire to meet him as soon as possible. I see. It doesn't please you? No. No, my work is here. Medicine, my books, my life. But you have become famous, Michel. You can't stay buried in this forgotten corner of Provence forever. I am more likely to find a tomb in Paris than in Salon. Now, the patronage of a queen is no empty thing, especially this queen. <laughs> She can bestow wealth, power, even a pattern of nobility, if you please her. Rather, if my prophecies please her. But my old friend, time is not subject to Catherine de' Medici. I can read the future. I cannot shape it to fit her desires, nor mine. Michel, God has seen fit to grant you sight and knowledge beyond that of other men. Whatever the risk, it is your duty to use this blessing for France. A blessing that I can see so much change so little. Would you call that a blessing, Count, or a curse? Very well. You may inform the Queen of France that Nostradamus, the prophet, awaits her pleasure. I find you disappointing, Maitre de Notre Dame. Extremely disappointing. I'm sorry, Your Majesty. I had expected a long beard, flowing robes, perhaps a bit of greenish fire. <laughs> the day of Merlin has long passed, Your Majesty. I am a scientist, not a magician. Are you? And these quatrains that you call the centuries, are they a part of your science? Even so, Your Majesty. What form? Astrology? Astronomy? Alchemy? A little of many sorts, and beyond that, I believe that certain men inherit the gift of prophecy, of clairvoyance, of mental transference, if you like, the ability to communicate by the power of mind alone across space or time. My father had it, and his father. And these images of yours, do you see them clearly? As though I lived them, walking the streets of another century, and quivering beneath the mountain-shattering power of weapons yet undreamed. But your book is most unclear. Sometimes, Your Majesty, it is expedient to conceal meaning and intent till time itself shall wipe clean the glass. <laughs> I expect a Merlin and find a Machiavelli. Well, perhaps you're right. It is not wisdom for most men to know too much. We shall get on, I think. You may leave now and draw up my horoscope. What is it Your Majesty wishes to know? The future of the House of Valois and of my sons. Oh, madame, they will be kings of France. All three? All three. I see. And their sons? No, Your Majesty. Francis and Charles and Henri shall be the last of the House of Valois. I think you have made a mistake, monsieur. 
My court astrologers say that our line will rule France for 300 years more, at the least. In 300 years, there will be no kings in France. You predict an anarchy? Perhaps, Your Majesty, though it will be called a republic. Hmm. Well, I will not argue the unknown. What of Spain? The days of her glory grow short. Her empire will shrivel and die. Then France will be the greatest power in Europe. No, Your Majesty. Great, but not the greatest. Which then? England, Your Majesty. England? Oh, absurd. And after her, a new land, still unborn, that shall grow in the wilderness of America. Oh, fantastic. I tell Your Majesty only that which I have seen. Then I suggest that you look again. I fancy you will make few friends at court, Maitre de Notre Dame, if your visions are all like these. Fortunately, I require but one friend. So? Time, Your Majesty. Time and truth. While the star with the hairy tail is visible, three great princes will become enemies. Peace will receive a blow from the heavens there will be earthly upheavals. The Po and the Tiber will be in flood, and there will be a serpent on the shore. A star with a furry tail? The comet, of course. And the king's messenger brings word from Rome that on that very night, the earth trembled and the Tiber overflowed its banks. Incredible. What's more, when the waters receded, they found a strange sea beast cast up on the river shore. I tell you, Angelique, this Nostradamus is a sorcerer. Three great princes, France, Spain, England. The comet still shines, and the truce is broken. A lucky guess, nothing more. I tell you, Countess, Nostradamus is a charlatan. The great king will acquire new relatives. Before he shall have rendered up his soul, the people will see him take for kindred eagles, lions, and a cross. The eagles are Spain, and Princess Elizabeth will marry the Spanish crown prince. Scotland's a lion. Why, that's the Dauphin's wedding with the Queen of Scots. But what about the cross? Haven't you heard? The king has arranged another marriage between his sister Margot and the Count of Savoy. Soon, monsieur, the policy of France will be set by prophecy. <laughs> We, Henri, by grace of God and Saint-Denis, King of France, do hereby pronounce that Maître Michel de Notre Dame is from this day forward to be physician and ordinary to our person and counselor to the crown, and that he shall be accorded such titles, monies, and privileges as shall be suitable to this high office. In just a moment, we return to the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. I'm sure that everyone who has friends with little daughters has this problem. You're devoted to the little girls, and you like to remember them on all holidays and when you visit their homes. But it's a shopping problem, and expensive, too. Well, here's the perfect solution. Give them some of the new Hallmark dolls from the land of make-believe. Little girls love these dolls from their favorite stories. There's Cinderella, Little Red Riding Hood, Peter Piper, 16 dolls in all, beautifully dressed in fairyland costumes, trimmed with real plumes and sparkling beads. And here's the best part. The dolls open up, and inside is printed their story in delightful verse. Now, these stand-up storybook dolls cost just 25 cents each, complete with envelopes for mailing. There's a collector's album, too, for just 50 cents, that holds all 16 dolls, keeping them fresh indefinitely. Now, doesn't this solve the problem of frequent gifts for all your young friends? Uh, incidentally, you'll see pictures of these Hallmark dolls in next week's Life magazine. And, of course, you'll find them now at any fine store where Hallmark cards are featured. Ask soon to see the new Hallmark dolls from the land of make-believe. And now Lionel Barrymore brings you the second act of our true story of Nostradamus. The 
been ordinary and counselor to Henri II and Catherine de' Medici. In a few short months, the uncanny prophecies of Dr. Michel de Notre Dame had carried him a good long way from his quiet study at Salon. But he was soon to learn that honors sit uneasy on the heads of those who must rely on the favors of kings or queens. What is this? The French army in Italy will be troubled throughout the conflict and sustain great loss. Can you find no better prophecy, monsieur? I regret, your majesty, that I cannot. And this one. The great city, suddenly and to its repentance, will be taken by assault. Surprised in the night, its defenses will be broken down. The guards and lines of communication at Saint-Quentin will be destroyed and its gates battered in. You must be aware, monsieur, that Saint-Quentin is invulnerable. Then your majesty has nothing to fear. I assure you that this is no laughing matter, doctor. My concern is not prophecy, but policy. Policy? Your predictions and their results have been widely published and advisedly. The people have come to trust in them. The army as well. But your majesty does not. I trust in fate so long as it serves my ends. When it does not, I remold it. I see. May I ask how, your majesty? Ah, oh, let me see. These, these portents of yours, they show no victory? Not in Italy. In the north, however, at Calais. Calais. Oh, you may have skill at prophecy, monsieur, but you have none at tactics. Calais has been in English hands for over 200 years. If its recapture were feasible, it would have fallen generations since. I know nothing of that, Your Majesty. I only know what I have seen in the book of the future. Then you must look again. You will destroy these verses and prepare new ones concerning our victories on the plains of Italy. I have told Your Majesty before I am able to read the future, but not to change it. Perhaps you underestimate your power, Monsieur, and mine. I can try, Your Majesty, but I am afraid I shall fail. I trust you are mistaken, Michel de Notre Dame, for France's sake and for yours. Dear Count, outside my window, the bells of Notre Dame toll the death of Saint-Quentin and of many thousands of loyal Frenchmen. And my heart is heavy as the tolling bell. I had hoped that my knowledge, my skills, while unable to change the course of the future, might lessen its cost in blood and in tears. One moment. Admiral de Coligny. Good evening, Monsieur the Prophet. It's nearly midnight. I am aware of it. I come on the Queen's errand, Maitre de Notre Dame, not on my own. I see. I am to escort you. Very well. I shall be ready as soon as I change to a coat more suitable for the Louvre. Not the Louvre, Monsieur. The Bastille. The Bastille, three paces by three, a coffin for the living. And yet, what other ending can there be for those who must live by the smiles of kings? And yet it wouldn't matter if I could but foresee the one thing still hidden from me. If I could be sure that in the centuries to come, men will know my prophecies and profit from them. All right, Prophet, time now. There is to be no trial. <laughs> in the Bastille? <laughs> of course I had forgotten. Reason is not yet queen in France. What is that? How should I know? You are the prophet. 
In here. Go on, Prophet. Step in. Meet your future face to face. Good morning, Michel de Notre Dame. Your Majesty. You seem surprised to see me. I must confess it, sire. Does the Queen know of this little visit? She most certainly does not. I see. It is a hard thing, Doctor, for a woman to admit to a mistake. It is even harder for a queen. A mistake, sire. Her Majesty believed that your gloomy predictions concerning her Italian venture and the fall of Saint-Quentin were in some fashion responsible for the tragedies that beset us. That you were guilty of treason to France and to the Crown. And you, sire, did you believe this too? I am a king, Doctor. I am also a husband. In any case, you were the Queen's favorite, not mine. Then may I ask why Your Majesty favors me now? Don't you know, Michel de Notre Dame? Listen to the bells of Paris. They are pealing triumph now. It seems that one of my generals had more faith in your prophecies than in the Queen's strategy. Instead of rushing to the aid of Saint-Quentin, he attacked at Calais. And one, sire? And one. Those bells announced that after two centuries, the greatest port of France again belongs to the French. In a few hours, Doctor, your name will be on every tongue in Paris, and they will call you a hero of France, and rightly. Your Majesty is most generous. Choose your prize. To be a count, a duke, an ambassador, perhaps. I seek but one reward, Your Majesty. Permission to leave Paris, to return to my studies in Provence. Nothing more. No, sire. With your majesty, I leave my gratitude and my prayers. Strange. Only a little while ago, I should not have thought it possible that king and prophet could stand together like this as friends. But of course, Michel de Notre Dame, you have known it from the first. Yes, your majesty. From the first. of tonight's drama, you've heard a few of the uncanny prophecies of the man who called himself Nostradamus, but his predictions didn't end with his own century. Frank Goss? Yes, Mr. Barrymore? Suppose we give our friends a few samples. All right, sir. Uh, how about this one? A university professor under the aegis of a vigorous young nation will save the country in February. There will be the fall of the Chateau Fort and assault on three fronts. The conflict will commence near Serbia. It is a mortal war. <laughs> on February the 3rd, 1917, Woodrow Wilson, an ex-university professor and president of a young nation, broke off relations with Germany. The first American troops entered the war at Chateau Thierry. Oh, yes. And World War I started at Sarajevo in Serbia. <laughs> Time for one more, Frank. Um, how about... The red government will be no longer in the public eye. Little by little, the leaders of nations will cast it off. Ah, that's one we hope is coming true right this very minute. <laughs> well, how about the future? Well, sir, Nostradamus prophesies wars and struggles with new and frightful weapons through the 20th century. But with the year 2000... He says the world will enter on a thousand years of prosperity and plenty and peace. Uh, that's the final prophecy of Nostradamus. And, Frank, it's the ultimate hope of mankind. You know, none of us can say whether Nostradamus was really clairvoyant or not. But I'm sure after tonight's interesting story, we can all agree Michel de Nostradam played a major role in the shaping of the history of his times. <laughs> Once again, here is Frank Goss. Before we leave tonight, I'd like to remind you that you'll find the selection of St. Patrick's Day cards wherever you buy Hallmark cards. And tomorrow is just about the last day you can have the fun of choosing some of these delightful designs. I say fun because I don't know of any group of holiday cards that has more gaiety, more color, and humor than these Hallmark St. Patrick's Day cards. They're bright with shiny green. 
shamrocks and harps and pipes and all the beloved whimsy of the Emerald Island. They've captured the Irish wit and that uh, bit of blarney we all enjoy so much. And, of course, you don't have to be a Flanagan or Casey to send or receive St. Patrick's Day cards. It has come to be an occasion when everyone welcomes the chance to say a cheery top of the morning to their neighbors. So don't forget to pick up some St. Patrick's Day cards at a fine store that features Hallmark cards. The familiar Hallmark and crown on the back will make this holiday brighter, too, because it says that you care enough to send the very best. And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. Ah, sure, and the Irish have a way with them, don't they, Frank? They certainly do, Mr. Barrymore. <laughs> it was Chesterton, I believe, who wrote for the great gales of Ireland and the men that God made mad. For all their wars are merry and all their songs are sad. <laughs> of course, he, he didn't have to add that their charm is contagious. And that's why we all enjoy being Irish, <laughs> or pretending to be, on St. Patrick's Day. And I'm sure those St. Patrick's Day cards you just told us about have their own Irish charm to fit the day, just as Hallmark cards always do. Mr. Barrymore, suppose you tell the folks about our story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame next week. Well, Frank, next week we'll tell the little-known story of Edmund Burke, the British member of Parliament who played a remarkable role in establishing the independence of the American colonies. <laughs> and we're especially pleased to welcome back to the Hallmark Hall of Fame one of our favorite stars, Mr. Herbert Marshall. <laughs> Until next week, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. <laughs> an important announcement from the makers of Hallmark Cards. Boys and girls of high school age can win big cash prizes for themselves and for their schools in the Hallmark Hall of Fame contest. All you do is nominate a person for the Hallmark Hall of Fame and tell in a brief essay why you chose that person. See the March 10th issues of Scholastic Magazines for full details on the rules and cash prizes for the Hallmark Hall of Fame contest. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Our producer-director is William Prue. Our script tonight by Robert E. L. Libet. Edgar Barrier was heard as Nostradamus. Featured in our cast were Paula Winslow, Gloria Henry, Polly Bear, Ted DeCorsia, William John Stone, and Herb Ellis. And next Sunday, the Hallmark Hall of Fame on television will bring you the exciting but little-known story of one of the world's greatest science fiction writers, Jules Verne. This is Frank Goss, saying goodnight to you until next week at this same time, when we'll present the story of Edmund Burke, starring Mr. Herbert Marshall. The following week, an exciting story from the life of Russell Conwell on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.